Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Welcome, guys, to our new podcast series, Data Movers. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, founder and CEO of JSA, along with my fabulous co host, Mr. Evan Christel, top B2B social media influencer. Yeah, great to be here, Jamie, for this inaugural podcast where we're sitting down uh, with some of the most influential men and women in today's telco and data center world who are supporting the uh, growing and complex network infrastructure requirements of this new world we live in. Yeah. Um, before we get to our first guest, which you are really excited about, how are you doing? How are things uh, in the OC, as we, we say? Great. As, as uh, those who uh, read my blog know, I had a baby girl, Ava, Ava Capri. Um, so that was four months ago already. And so back on off of maternity leave and back excited to be uh, part of our amazing industry. Um, and there's a lot going on, you know, things. Are yeah. Really yeah. The things are, are never quiet in our neck of the woods in terms of tech, but have you got her the new iPhone uh, four months old? That's about the right time, right? You know, yeah. There's the rattle in one hand and the iPhone in the other. <laughs> <laughs> That's my babysitting advice, frankly. That's what my mom does. She's like, just throw them the phone and they'll play with the games. And I'm like, yes, and they'll also call Tokyo. So like, can we, you know, uh, but yeah, um, the new iPhone is is crazy too. It's got, uh, it's 5G ready, apparently. Always something to get you with, with the new iPhone. And it's actually a pretty big release for us people on the network side. Uh, obviously, a 5G has been overhyped to some degree, but the, the fact that the iPhone with 5G is real, means that you're going to see millions of new devices and applications and use cases emerging. And uh, the network is going to have to evolve uh, accordingly. So that's kind of what we're here to talk about. Yeah. And uh, that brings us to our fantastic guest, a dear friend of mine for uh, 20 plus years. I don't want to say it. Um, but um, as you know, data movers, um, we really want to dive into our our um, speakers, background stories here, his careers, highs and lows, unique perspectives of the future, our industry. Um, and there was no other person that we could think of to, to uh, do our inaugural data movers um, than with our amazing guest today, Mr. Eric Kontag, executive chairman of GlobeNet and of course, president of Suboptic. Eric, welcome to Data Movers. Jamie Lemon, thank you so very much for having me here today. I'm so excited and honored to be able to share this scenario podcast. This is great. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Eric and, and Jamie and Eric. This is what we call a beta test. So you're our first uh, uh, beta tester. <laughs> uh, and, and you're actually calling from uh, sunny New England in Rhode Island, which, you know, is, is nice to uh, nice to see. Yes, yes, indeed. I, uh, while our office is in Fort Lauderdale, I'm really enjoying the, the Northeast this time of the year. Yeah, it's a good, a good time of the year. It's kind of our season of, uh, of fall before the snow starts to settle. But let's start talk by talking about your background. Um, I, I wonder if you've been in the telecom industry longer than I have, which is about 30 years. So to give you some context, but maybe you can talk through where you started and how you got to where you are now. Actually, I didn't. Um, I didn't start in telecom and, and I, I joke that I hated telecom. <laughs> I started my, my career actually in San Diego, California, working for a company called General Atomics um, as part of the team there working on nuclear energy stuff, fusion, fission experiments, et cetera. Um, I was invited to join the startup team of the San Diego Supercomputer Center. So ever since I was very much involved with high tech, um, the, the latest stuff on the compute side, supercomputer graphics, um, and so on. And, and I was fortunate to, to be at a time there at a time where everything was, was new. So we tested all sorts of stuff. It was, it was like a big startup that, that exists today, um, which led me from doing um, local area networks that were brand new back then 
to um, help build the first uh, National Science Foundation Network, the NSFNet, which is the granddaddy um, of the internet that had replaced ARPANET at the time. And so I was always on the data side of things. Um, that gave me the opportunity to move to Latin America where my parents um, were living. And I had a younger brother that I hadn't seen growing up and it was just perfect to launch my first startup uh, it being a, a company focused on local air networks, um, it, going to the largest companies like um, oil and gas and, and education and computer animation and so on, an awful lot of fun. From there, I jumped to uh, computer graphics representing SGI, that was a household name in the animation world, eventually in the in the data set, um, in the server world and and the internet. And that led me to a couple of other companies and things were going great until I, I joined a good friend of mine and we decided to build a, um, basically a platform for the converged world of mobility and the internet. This is in the 1999 timeframe, early 2000s. And Evan, you mentioned before that um, 5G was a little bit overhyped. Well, if you go back 20 years, 3G was overhyped. So everything that we're doing today with, with 4G is what we thought we were gonna get from, let's say from 3G. And we set out to build this, this um, startup move to the United States. It helped that the political turmoils in Latin America were not great. Um, and I got, let's say, exposed to that convergent space. This, this time that startup became a statistic from the dot-com bust. And then a good friend of mine called me up and said, hey, there's this Brazilian telecom operator and they're buying a SEPSI network. And I think it would be perfect for it because it's a turnaround job. And so we bought the assets from 360 Network. I joined GlobeNet. And what enticed me to do that in 2003 was the fact that you had this amazing digital network. This was the side of telecom that I didn't really know much about. Um, and I didn't have to do with the old analog incumbent type, let's say mentality, right? And so I saw this as a combination of a great startup and a turnaround job that sitting on a huge infrastructure asset that was the latest network that had been built um, in our region. And that's kind of what got me into telecom. I thought that I would have stayed with Globenet maybe three to five years, and it's been a little bit more than that, let's put it that way, because every three years, something fun, different happened. Here's where I am today. And that's when I met Eric. Uh, he was a client at Telex, um, one of our, our early, early uh, clients. And, um, and I had started at Telex as their head of marketing and PR. And, um, and yeah, and so early on, we were trying to figure out, well, what else can we do to promote GlobeNet to the Telex community? <laughs> Let's do postcards. <laughs> that's, that's right, that's right. We did a lot of those things. I mean, we, we've had a lot of firsts, I think, at GlobeNet and something that I'm very proud of, right? We, uh, we were the first subsea cable in our region to have carrier ethernet. Um, as one of our products when people are not even talking about that. Um, we extended our networks into new markets, even terrestrially over um, uh, OPGW wirelines to service Manaus, for example. Uh, we've replaced cable segments and so on. So there's, there's a lot of things that were happening. And latency, we became the very first um, subsea network basically to look at latency and, and deliver services between the Bovespa Stock Exchange and, and New York City. So, so definitely a lot of firsts and a lot of fun. Yeah. As if we were on a high-speed yacht versus a little rowboat. <laughs> that, that was actually one of our postcards, Jamie, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, Carrier Ethernet too, it was uh, MEF certified, I wanna say, right? I mean, yes. we were doing things early on uh, that was, uh, just incredible and now have become uh, through uh, Eric's leadership, um, subsea standards, if you will. Um, and you know, your role, uh, not just as chairman of GlobeNet, but uh, now um, president of Suboptic. I mean, you, you are always speaking uh, and, uh, and gathering committees together to, to think about the future of sub, subsea. Um, any, uh, any thoughts there? What do you see coming up? 
But absolutely, I think, you know, I think our success at GlobeMed had also a lot to do with the fact that right from the beginning, we embraced partnerships um, that had to be part of our DNA because we couldn't do it all alone, right? So you, you have the SUPSI network that is basically a link between two terrestrial networks and nowadays more a link between two data centers. And so you depend on somebody else to be able to deliver that end-to-end -end service. And when we started, for example, with Carrier Ethernet and the MEF and so on, we, we had to convince our partners in Latin America, this is a good thing, right? This is something that you need to look at. And I think when, when you look at technology or what I've always done is I look at the developing world, right? I look at the US, I look at Europe, I see what's, what's going on in Asia and so on. And you know that eventually what's happening here today will happen in the developing world versus the developed world. If you look at that, it, it will happen in say three years, five years later, right? So that gives you a little bit of time not necessarily to be the beta tester or version 1.0 user of a product, but, but you're already looking at, at what is established, what's gonna work, um, and, and you need to make sure that the economics are good, right? And if you apply that also to the, to the subsea industry, now putting on perhaps my, my suboptic hat, um, as you know, Jamie, we, we completed a phenomenal series of, of um, online executive roundtable spotlight that that you so graciously helped us to pull off um, earlier this year, where we were asking the question, you know, how is COVID-19 impacting the global communications fabric? And I think the learnings that came from that series is that our global network proved to be resilient. I mean, at work, we, we, we didn't, it didn't collapse, but there's many lessons learned that came from that, right? And so when you look at that entire ecosystem or the value chain, you have to ask yourself the questions, you know, why did it work? Why didn't it collapse? We had excess inventory, we were able to use that because we did see a huge spike of data in particular, say in, in our neck of the woods in the April timeframe of this year, March timeframe. And people didn't think that it was gonna to continue to grow. They thought that it would plateau out. And if you look at the numbers, um, gaming jumped initially 30%. And then you ask the same people, let's say at the exchanges, how do you see that? a month ago, and it's now continues to be in a 50% growth rate. And if you talk to one of the larger OTTs, they looked at their media platforms and they didn't jump 10%, 20%, they jumped 35 times. That is huge. And to be able to absorb that amount of data, you, you just need to have that physical infrastructure ready and the available headroom, let's say, to do it. Yeah. But we also learned many, many things in that process, right? Um, awareness of the global communications infrastructure is critical. So the work, for example, that other organizations such as ICPC are doing to talk to the governments, to push them to have a single point of contact to, hey, we need to work with each other because if you've got all these oil tankers parked, which happened actually in the month of, of a, late April, early May, where nobody was driving, right, cars. So where are you gonna store all that, that, that fuel? They, they have to park outside of the protection zone of subsea cables because if they anchor, you could create damage or you've had a crew on a ship, seafarers already for months that need to go home. Can you quarantine inside the ship, for example? So, so people started to talk and collaborate. And I think that that was critical and has been critical keeping our global communications infrastructure running, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is what happens now? I mean, major OTTs, for example, accelerated their 2021, 2022 investments to 2020, just to make sure that they didn't run out of bandwidth, yeah. right? So th those are some of the things that, that, we, that we are seeing. Um, and I think collaboration and co-opetition is key in order to keep that fabric strong, um, resilient and, and up and running. Wow, well done. Well, that's that's something I wasn't even aware of. You know, as Americans here in the U.S., speaking for myself in the telecom industry, I, I don't know anything about the LATAM market. I would probably say that's true for most of us in the industry here. So give us a snapshot or some highlights of, of what's happening in the market. I know it's very diverse and and it's a, it's a huge uh, area, area geographically and market-wise. What, what are some highlights and trends that we could learn from and some insights uh, you might be able to share? I, I think from a telecom perspective, you're going to find that that LATAM is not too different, let's say, than in some cases the U.S. or 
or Europe, right? So if, if I'm going to talk broadly, for example, about the operators, just like we in the United States had to learn to deal with work from home, I mean, think about it. Most networks were designed to provide that level of resiliency to the enterprise, to physical buildings, downtown New York, right? Or downtown LA or places like that. And, and those areas are empty. People are working not only from home, but they're, they've decided to move to rural areas. And, and so now you need a very different network. Um, and mind you, you can go through New Hampshire, through the streets or here in Barrington, Rhode Island, or even Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And, and you'll constantly see trucks of people blowing new fiber, fixing fiber, laying fiber. And I think one of the things that COVID-19 has done is it has accelerated that fiber to the premise, fiber to the home process. And, and I think that we in our industry need to stop thinking of that reach to the end user as the last mile. We need to start thinking of it as a first mile. So if you really want to do eventually good telemedicine, maybe uh, be able to, to uh, talk to a patient that is doing remote dialysis and stuff like that, that, that network needs to be really, really strong. So some of those things we're also seeing in Latin America where perhaps the, the last mile was a lot weaker than it is in the United States. Um, so um, different telcos had to really rush to build out that last mile to increase capacity, to redesign their networks, to move the IP traffic, to make them more resilient. Um, I think it's also pushed for, we need updated regulation. Um, if we want to launch 5G and everything that has to do with 5G, we need to look at how is this going to be done? And what you start to see is that there's not enough capital to do everything. So if I take Brazil as an example, which is 10 times larger than perhaps any other market in Latin America, you start to see companies that are saying, look, we did okay in 4G, but maybe this is not our strength anymore. Let's sell off that wireless group and you're gonna go back to having maybe three strong wireless operators because the capital that is needed to cover an entire nation that's the size of the United States is huge. And then let us focus perhaps on a backbone network or a national backbone network that is very strong, that is very robust, et cetera. I mean, if you think of 5G, Evan, you know this you know, better than many, many people, you're gonna have, it has the capability of delivering 10X data to the handset. And in order to do that, you, you really need to beef up those networks. Now, you may argue that 80% of that is maybe going to stay local. Well, is that really true? I mean, that's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Is that really true now with the work from home, right? I think that some technologies, like, for example, autonomous vehicles, you know, they're going to develop first here, maybe in Europe, and then eventually they're, they're going to go to Latin America, where Perhaps today they may not make that much sense. But if you think of long haul trucking routes where you have tons of accidents, where you have drivers that are underpaid, they're driving 23, 24 hours a day, and then you have accidents because they fall asleep. Um, those are routes where you say, man, in order to get my mango from the Amazon um, delivered here at my closest shopping center, we need to improve, let's say services. I think, honestly, we're at a, at a phase where we're going to see exponential growth and innovation and in technology. There are a lot of things happening just because of Moore's law, right? Just because we have doubled the capacity of compute and double the capacity of graphics over the last 18 months following, let's say that the, the Moore's law, where now there's things that are possible that before were just not medical imaging analysis, for example, and things like that. Um, because we live in a connected world, you see scientists in Latin America collaborating with scientists in all over the world, not just the US, right? Where they're looking at the next generation of vaccine where they're saying, hey, maybe we can use CRISPR to do some gene editing to come up with the next coronavirus vaccine and stuff like that. Um, so all that interaction, all that global interaction requires very robust networks. And so while many of these subsea networks, for example, that are being built around the globe, in particular, these massive large networks are optimized to connect data center to data center, we're starting to see projects that are circumnavigating globes, like for example, the latest release of a network around Africa. Because if we don't start thinking about those things, those island nations, for example, or the Caribbean or the smaller countries, if they're not considered, you're just increasing the digital divide, right? 
So infrastructure is going to play and continue to play a, a very important role in our connected world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, COVID uh, obviously throwing a, a huge spotlight on how, how digital divide is, is uh, really impacting, you know, the future um, uh, education and, uh, you know, how do you raise a child in this uh, if you have no uh, steady internet? Um, it's, um, it's definitely uh, an issue. Now, circling back um, throughout your career, thinking of all the amazing experiences and knowing what you know now, if you could go back in time, give us one piece of advice uh, that you would say to yourself at the beginning of your career, what would it be? If I would have learned about the stock market back then, <laughs> I would have invested in these tiny little startup companies that we use to build out the networks in San Diego. People like Cisco that were in a garage up in Menlo Park. This is all well and good, but I need stock tips today. I need, yeah. I need, <laughs> I need names and, and, I, and uh, I, I'm on my Robinhood app here. I, I need to trade something now. So I'm looking for some stock tips, please. Just and kidding. That that's one that we'll probably have to take offline, right? <laughs> that, that's right. But it's but it's critical for for people to start looking at these things. And and when I talked to my kids, I said, look, um, my older son that just starting his career in San Diego, California, of all places, where I started, uh, he says, Dad, what should I do with this? I said, Well, get yourself a broker and start learning about these because um, there's many companies out there that are unicorns today that. 10 years ago, we didn't even know what their names were, right? And it's just gonna get faster and faster and faster. Mm -hmm. so, so focusing on things like artificial intelligence and, and a lot of those offshoots, um, that, that's where, if you wanna take the rest, there's a couple of companies there that should definitely look at. Yeah. At home alcohol delivery, Drizzly, that's the future, uh, <laughs> particularly in the pandemic. But in all seriousness, uh, shifting gears to your personal life, how are you coping with the pandemic and have you developed any new hobbies or maybe focused on some existing hobbies to kind of keep sane in this, in this difficult time? Well, uh, yes. I mean, I was on the road 95% of my time and then, you know, come uh, March 17th, when I flew back from Sao Paulo, um, all of a sudden that stopped. Right. So ab absolutely. So you, you, learn, you learn to cope, right? I mean, there's things that you can do, obviously, to keep engaged. But one of my hobbies is aviation. Um, and, and I think, Evan, to some extent, yours, right? Well, mine from a uh, Microsoft flight simulator standpoint, you know, so I, I think you might actually fly real airplanes, I, if I'm I, I do, I do. I, I, started, um, I started early in my, when I was in college, um, I got my private pilot's license and work up through my different ratings and my instrument and commercial ticket and flight instructor. And then life happened. I moved from San Diego, California to, to Latin America and they didn't recognize my ratings and I had these startups and eventually a family. And, you know, for 30 years, I stopped, I stopped flying. And um, a few years ago, um, a business friend of mine asked, um, we were sitting there at a discussion of two CEOs, um, you know, what's your passion? I started to talk about strategy and whatever. And, oh, no, 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 that's not, what about you? And I said, God, I used to fly. Oh my God, are you a pilot? I said, yeah. And then I got pushed to, you got to get back into it. You know, you got to do this. And I, and I did. And it's been super rewarding. And so during COVID-19, of course, I went back to the books because most flight schools were closed. And, and, uh, and then as they started to open up, then... I've I rejoined my recurrent training. You, you have to stay on top of things. Uh, it, it's, it's a good time to, to relearn the things that you haven't learned. I actually did a course called the Rusty Pilot Seminar just to bring me up to speed on things that needed to be done. And so now, now I'm keeping it up. And the freedom of flying in the U.S. is amazing. And so yeah, it's definitely a passion of mine. Love that. Fantastic. Well, we may need to hitchhike on one or two of those flights coming up. But uh, thanks for sharing. Absolutely. So I'd like to move us into what I call our rapid fire section. So um, tell us just the first thing that comes to mind when I say, what's an upcoming purchase you're thinking of? Come on, none, you gotta save, it's COVID-19. <laughs> no, well, okay, uh, iPhone 12, 
um, favorite food that would surprise people? Well, most people know me as a carnivore. I love anything that is, let's say, that is grilled. But I would say in that space, grilled artichokes. Oh, that's a good one. I like that one. Uh, and if you could watch one movie on repeat for 24 hours straight, I'm not sure why you would, but if you could, what would it be? My favorite movie is Cinema Paradiso. And that's one that, that definitely uh, speaks to me and I wouldn't mind it seeing it over and over again. Nice. But if I would have, let's say, just a fun choice, there's a bunch of them like Die Hard or Lethal Weapon series or... Everyone knows The Godfather is the only the answer Godfather. for that question. Come on. Uh, and my husband plays it on repeat every Christmas. <laughs> it's so weird. My, my nephews are like, is this what Christmas means? I'm like, just walk away, walk away. <laughs> Christmas, it's a wonderful life. Come on, that must be oh, one of the best yeah. movies. Yes. Um, so what celebrity do you think you look like? Andy Garcia. Good one. Oh, I see it. it. Yes, yes. And one word that people like to use to describe you. Um, charismatic. Yes, absolutely. Innovative. Innovative. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Um, so, uh, so thank you so much, Eric, for taking your time to be our our inaugural guinea pig <laughs> here at Data Movers. Uh, we are just thrilled and uh, getting, uh, I, I, like I took some notes because I didn't realize all these things that you have done and getting a, a, a deeper dive into your background was so cool. Uh, uh, you think you know someone for 20 years and then, you know, artichoke come up. Artichoke, <laughs> uh, so, oh, uh, Jamie, I mean, no, I'd like to thank you and Evan. This, this certainly has been an awful lot of fun. And I think um, we, we need these things. Evan, so you asked about... Yeah, this is the height of my social outlet for the week here. So yes, let's, we'll yeah. meet for a beer, a socially distanced down in Providence, uh, you know, sometime this winter. Absolutely. I'd love that for sure. All right. Take you up on it. If you enjoyed today's Data Movers podcast, be sure to check out jsa.net slash podcast for upcoming Data Movers episodes, releasing every other week on Wednesday mornings, as well as other JSA podcast series. And additionally, you can follow us on Twitter at jscado and of course at Evan Christel. I'm sure you're all following him, but if not, you know, he's the guy on Twitter to follow. In the meantime, thank you all. God bless and happy networking.